said, are you drinking uh, Gatorade? You, you're getting your electrolytes up. And I said, no. I said, well, you need to because you'll notice a, a, a quick change. When you're saturated and you're hydrated, you'll notice a change. And so no doubt, just in a course of a day, drinking some things that help to bring all the levels up changed everything. My, my, I didn't have a headache. I, it was all kinds of things that were just came into line. And so, uh, and so what we want to do this summer is, is we want to see God pour out his spirit in this place and be replenished and be refreshed. And be refocused, right? How many think that sounds like a great uh, series? It's not a series. It's an experience. We're not looking for a series for the summer. We're looking for an experience. And so I want you to start praying that way, would you? With pastor. And, uh, and, and please do that. So, but today, it's, it's my, uh, my, uh, my privilege to be able to just be in here. How many of you got a Band-Aid when you came in? Let me see them. You got them there? You can take them out of the pack. Go ahead and take them out of the pack. Feel free. Open the pack if you're able to do it. You're able to take them out. You're going to need them in just a minute, just a few minutes. And so I just wanted you to bring, I wanted to give something to you. I believe in engaging people in what I do. And uh, it's important uh, for you not to be a spectator, but to be a participant in the word of God this morning and in, in the worship. And I appreciate the heart this morning uh, of worship. Thank you guys uh, for sharing that. In fact, the, one of the very songs that you sang today, Kathy, I heard when I got up this morning and I, I, I got dressed first and I went out into the living room. I, I often will open up my uh, French doors. I go out onto my porch. Uh, if I can be outside, I'm outside every time I can. And it's a little, it's cool. Turn the fan on. And I said, on the way through the, on the, way through the place, I said, uh, and I can't say it out loud because my phone will activate but I, I, I spoke to Google. If I, if I do it right now, it's going to start doing stuff. But I said, I asked Google to play worship music for me. And, and of course, Google said, oh, okay, playing, uh, playing worship music, playing worship now from your Spotify playlist. Came up, started playing. And one of the songs it played was the very song that you played where it talks about you surround me. And it talks about how that sometimes we feel like we're surrounded but he's surrounding us. It's a difference in perspective. And so today I wanted to, to talk to you just for a few minutes and, and share with you just a little bit, uh, uh, really on the, on, the, on the theme of, of, of T-shirts and scars. And, uh, you know, growing up as a, as a preacher's kid, sometimes, man, uh, was very painful. I had the opportunity when I was... Uh, in Sri Lanka, which I shared on a Sunday night. Some of you may have been there, some of you may not have. I shared with uh, Sri Lankan preacher's kids from across the country uh, uh, about being a preacher's kid. I've been a preacher's kid for a bunch of years now. And uh, for some people, I will never rise above being pastor's son. And I'm okay with that. There was a time I struggled with that. In fact, I used to say stuff like, uh, someone would say, how's it going? I'd say, it's good. I'm going through life with another guy's name because I'm a junior. Until one day a person said to me, hey, don't ever say that. Because they said, Pastor, it was one of my families that was out in the community, out in one of the roughest projects in town. And they said, uh, Did your, is, your dad, uh, is your dad faithful? Was your dad faithful to your mom? And I said, yeah. He said, my dad was running with every woman he could find. Is your dad out getting drunk and staying out all night and sometimes two, night, two days at a time? I said, no. And he went on through this whole list and he said, Pastor, you should never, ever say anything like that again. Because if I had a dad like yours, I would definitely, I definitely want to stand close to him. So, you know, sometimes, but as a preacher's kid, you know, I didn't understand a lot of those things. A preacher's kid, you know, I... I grew up in, uh, it was like living in a glass house with no place to have privacy. People were free to show up at all kinds of, with all kinds of problems and at all times of the day, all times of the night. In fact, there were times when my dad would leave vacation because there was something serious happening and he would go. And as a preacher's kid, some of you today, especially you younger families in here, you, you younger guys that are in here, uh, you might go, oh Lord, he didn't understand. But ministry has a cost to it. 
Whenever you choose to serve Christ, whenever you choose to surrender to God's will, whenever you choose to be a Christ follower, it, it has a cost to it. And the more you are in leadership, the higher the cost. You ever heard anybody at your, you ever heard anybody at your business or someplace you work? And they said, "Well, if I was in charge, if I was in charge, it'd be different. It wouldn't be like this." Actually, you know, if you were in charge, you couldn't get off at five o'clock every day. If you were in charge, you couldn't have your phone turned off and where no one could get a hold of you. If you were in charge, the way you behave now would not work for then. Okay, it would be difficult because it changes. And, you know, being a preacher's kid, man, there were times where that it was painful. It was painful. There were times when people would, were free to tell you exactly how you should behave. In fact, I said to the preacher's kids in Sri Lanka, I said, you know, people would say, hey, they'd say, hey, you shouldn't be acting like that. Your dad's a pastor. I never, ever heard anybody say, hey, your dad's, your dad's a garbage man. You shouldn't be acting like that. I never heard anybody say, Hey, your dad's a principal. You shouldn't be acting like that. I never heard that, but I did hear the other. And so there were times that I grew up with, uh, as time went on, I grew up and I heard, I uh, had some scars and t-shirts. I, I had some things that kind of hurt. In fact, somewhere around 11, 12, 13, depends on how old and what gender, whether it was young ladies are a lot uh, far ahead of, of boys at that age, they tend to pay more attention to other things, to, uh, to uh, adult kind of things, things where people are saying and all that. Boys are kind of do 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 you know, about that age. But you start hearing things, and you start hearing people say things about your parents, and you go, I thought everybody loved my mom and dad. Oh, I can't believe they don't love my mom and dad. And then all of a sudden, as a preacher's kid, you want to fight. <laughs> you want to stand up for them, right? But you get these things, you know, sometimes, well, I guess what I'm trying to say is, is that, you know, life's not fair. In fact, I remember, I've probably told you this story before, life's not fair. I remember the first time when my, when my dad left uh, uh, Carpenter's home, or First Assembly in Lakeland, when there were no mega churches, no mega churches in South Carolina at all, coast to coast, I mean, end to end. I came, we were in a mega church in Florida, in Lakeland, Florida. And I remember my dad took his first pastor to Maryland. Uh, the first service he started was a Wednesday. And we're standing there. I probably told you this before. If I did, forgive me. I've been here a long time. But I'm standing on the floor with my mom, about 12 years old, and the barber comes, the, the guy comes, he's a bald headed guy. He comes over and he goes, How are you, Miss Owen? And she's so nice and kind, and she shakes his hand, and the next thing you know, he looks over at me, and he reaches up, and he grabs my hair, and he goes, bring your son by my barbershop, and I'll make him look like a man and not like a girl. It was the first people I met in that church. Boy, don't you know I really love church after that. <laughs> Life's not fair. Though my mom, standing there, was very kind, very kind, and she said, thank you so much, and she called him, she asked his name, he told her. And off he went, and she never even looked at me. She put her hand on my shoulder as the man was walking away, and she just kind of leaned her head like this. She was still looking at him, smiling. And through her smile, she said, don't worry, son. I would never take you to a bald-headed barber. <laughs> what my mom was telling me was, look, we're your parents, and we're going to raise you. And uh, you be careful. Be careful. Don't let that stuff get on you. But at times, the, it does. In fact, life's not fair. I want you to watch this clip right here right now because life is not fair. Life is not easy and sometimes painful. Sometimes it's painful. We're live. Horton, going for a new PR. Can anybody guess what's going to happen next? Keep your feet up! Keep your feet up! Oh. <laughs> the 
this is the Rocky thing now. Oh. No, you don't even have to drop in. Just leave the board flat. Go on. Life is not fair. Sometimes, sometimes uh, you cause your own pain, but often things happen because of other people. We're going to talk about it just a little bit today. In fact, I need someone to help me today. And since, Christian, you're sitting on the third row, I need you to help me. Would you help me, man? He doesn't know he's helping me today. Would you come and help me, man? I need your help, man. You can stand right up here on the edge of the corner. I've got a great backpack for you here, and uh, I need you to come put it on. You have the perfect name for this because, you know, we're going through life. This life journey, man, is tough enough. It's tough enough, man. And when you add in, you add real life, and then you add in some of the pain, man, some of the things that really cause us trouble, some of those, those, those hurt and those, those disappointments and things, sometimes those things become heavy, okay? You all right, man? All right, okay, I want you to look out there and give them your best smile today, okay? You're going to help me. You didn't know you were going to help me, did you? Okay, that's what happens when you sit on the third row. Everybody's moving to the balcony now. <laughs> Please don't do it because the next time I'm picking somebody from the balcony, so, okay? So get ready. But you know what? Life's not fair. In fact, life hasn't been fair and life has been painful even as an adult. I mean, as a parent who's helped raise three children, at times, man, life has been painful with my kids. There are times when my kids uh, were going through something or said something or, or, or had an attitude or something. It really hurt my heart. It hurt my, it hurt Ms. Tan it hurt my wife. And, you know, it, it's, it's not hard for those kind of things to happen in life. You know, uh, your kids can bring real pain in your life. And it, and it doesn't stop when they're little. It can go on through their adult years. I used to think raising kids that when my kids were little, that was the, really the toughest time. But I tell you, that's not true. Because the older they get, the more decisions they make that are life-altering decisions. How many of you hear I just said? You're making decisions that change the course of your entire life. And so, you know what? That can be painful. There can be, it be painful. And there are moments where just like my father did with my, my baby brother or my brother, I remember my father praying, and I heard this prayer come out of his mouth. Devil, you cannot have my son. He belongs to Jesus, and you can't cross the bloodline, devil. I remember him praying those prayers. I also remember the service that my brother came to an altar here as, as, a, as a, a, a visiting evangelist, a singing evangelist, was, was playing and singing, and he said, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. There's a, there's a football player. You play football. I know who you are. I don't, I don't know your name. I can't see your face, but I know that's one thing about your life, and that was my brother. He was the only one they were waiting for. My brother came to the altar, and that day God transformed his life. Incredible things, right? But I'm going to tell you, raising kids, you can, it, it's painful at times. It, it, being an adult is, is not really easy. In fact, some people call it adulting. I love that word because I'm not sure exactly what it means. If it means being responsible and doing things that adults do, hey, go for it, right? If you're like 49 and you're just now starting to adult, hey, you better get on with it, man, right? You better get on with it. It can be painful, though. It, it can be incredibly painful. In fact, life's not fair as a leader or a pastor, Pastor gave us a staff a long time ago. I have it hanging on my wall. And one of the things it says in there is being a leader is lonely. There are often times where that there's loneliness that creeps in. And uh, it goes on through. Being a, being a leader is not easy. In fact, sometimes you, it's incredibly painful. Sometimes you make decisions, and those decisions, those decisions are painful to make. Sometimes you make decisions 
And the people who you are trying to help, they don't know all the details. And boy, you get kicked. <laughs> you get kicked and talk bad and all kinds of things. And what they don't know is, is that you didn't tell them all the details. Because if you had told them all the details, it would have destroyed them as a leader. Because they had team members on their team that said, hey, we're done. We're not going to do this anymore. Right? So being a leader is not easy. In fact, being an adult is not easy. It's painful at times. It's painful. Things can, and here's one of the things that really is true, you know, when you let people in your life that you care about, guess what? They can hurt you. How many of you know that's true? Somebody you don't know, they can't hurt you too much. But you let somebody in your life, it can hurt you. In fact, you know, it's, it's a funny thing because for me as a pastor, it is the toughest thing when I'm chasing down. I had a, a family with, a young, with young kids who were rolling out. They, were, they felt the Lord was leading them somewhere else, but they never even said goodbye to me. We opened our heart, and I go, those pains like that make you want to go, okay, I'm going to put the shield up, right? How many of you know those pains can be heavy? They can get, you doing okay over here, Christian? They can get, all right, you all right, man? Look at that, no, no problem, I'm going to put another one in, okay? The next one is a speaker, okay? So <laughs> you don't start wincing and showing a little bit of pain. You just, just like, like this, Christian, okay? Like that, okay? It's coming in, man, I'm just telling you, so you better get ready. You know what? You probably have this, you have pains as well. A pastor may have hurt you. Or someone at church may have hurt you. Or a family member may have hurt you and disappointed you and brought pain into your life. It's very possible because we're humans. In fact, in fact, not only are we just human, not only are we humans, but often our minds, our minds don't know the difference between a real thought, something that's factual, and something that's just fantasy. Our mind just fires off all kinds of thoughts, and sometimes we connect dots. Anybody ever connected a dot about someone that wasn't real? You couldn't connect, and you were proved wrong, right? Anybody? Uh, that happens at times. But you know what? It's painful at times. Maybe you've been hurt. You know what the Bible says? In this life, you'll have troubles. Life is not fair. And often it leaves us with residual baggage that can steal your joy and that can steal your faith away. In fact, in fact, I, I won't be real. Uh, when I was speaking with uh, uh, my Sri Lankan preacher's kids, because I am one, a preacher's kid, I was really transparent. I was really, really wide open. And I won't be quite as transparent this morning. But you know what? It was a weird thing. Coming to church on our anniversary was a weird thing. It was a weird moment. I felt incredibly melancholy coming here. In fact, Tam asked me in the car, are you okay? And I went, yeah. And then all of a sudden the tears started coming down my cheek. And I'm like, what is going on with me? You know what? We just got finished with the Sri Lanka trip and it was incredible. It was taxing. It was, I, we faced things that we'd never seen before. And then we went through district council where we worked with no day off. And we were working no day off in, in Sri Lanka for two weeks. No day off after that. And we were coming right into it. And I don't know if it was that or if it was that I was taking stock of where we are, where I'm at. Am I making a difference? Does it matter? Does it even matter? So I don't know what it was. But here's what I was reminded of from there. I was reminded, I feel like the Holy Spirit spoke to me, and he reminded me of his call. He reminded me, he reminded me of who we are. In fact, that was a great word this morning, of who I am, who we are in Jesus, who we are in Christ. In fact, this message, T-shirts and scars, this life journey that we make is more than challenging. It can be super pa painful, but when you add in being a Christ follower, it can, it can be over the top sometimes. There are probably people sitting in this room today. You okay, man? People sitting in this room today. i got to add a couple more then, man, because we gotta, we got to get you going here. There are probably a couple of people in this, in this place today who not only is disappointed in other people. Oh, you okay? Well, that, was, that did it, didn't it? Okay. 
You all right? I'm still not seeing any painful expressions on your face, so we're going to keep on going. So There are probably people who are disappointed in God. I've seen people do it. I've seen them get twisted around with God, that God somehow let them down. You know, pain is real. Disappointment is real. But you know what? Today, I'm challenged in this, and I was challenged as I presented a little piece of this uh, with, with the kids there in Sri Lanka. I was reminded that no one runs to pain. We often run from, where, uh, run from it when we can. In fact, in fact, it reminds me, you know, almost everybody has a, almost everybody has a t-shirt, man. <laughs> almost everybody has a t-shirt that probably of some sort that has a scar on it. I got a few t-shirts. I got a few scars. There's a place on my arm that I had a guy who didn't like me in high school and I played football three years. We were state champions my senior year. There's a guy, he didn't like me at all. And during one of the plays, man, he, he hit me after the play was blown dead, knocked me down and slid across the back of my arm here with a, with a cleat that had a, a, that had a metal jagged edge on it and opened my arm up. So every time I run my hand over that, I remember that guy. <laughs> I could call his name, but I won't do it, man. I won't do it today. But they're in Allegheny High School in Western Maryland. You see, when you get the scars and you start carrying them around, the pain of it, it starts getting heavy. You doing all right, man? All right? Hey, don't you just kind of do like this, man. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Up and down. Here we go. Because, you know, just do a normal thing. You okay, man? All right. All right. Jack, smile out there, man. Wince a little bit, okay? Uh, those pa- the pain, often, uh, we run from it. We don't want to be around that, man. We don't, we don't want to be anywhere. And I'm reminded, if you have your Bible today, and I want you to just kind of mark it so you can go back and read it in this, in Judges uh, chapter uh, 11 and 12, there's a story of a man who understood pain. This guy's name was Jephthah, and you say, Jephthah, who's that? In fact, you hear about Samson, you hear about Gideon, you hear about all those guys, you okay, man? Okay. You hear about all those guys, Moses. Abraham, but Jephthah is right there with those guys. In fact, Jephthah was one of the judges, and if you know the backstory, the pedigree of, of, uh, of Jephthah from Judges 11 and 12, he understood hurts and disappointments and crushed expectations. In fact, if you read it, Jephthah's mom was a prostitute. Jephthah was the product of his father's indiscretion. Now, how would you like to have that follow you your whole life? You can only imagine that when Jephthah was a kid, that his stepbrothers, because he had a bunch of stepbrothers and, and step siblings, those stepbrothers, they didn't like him too much. They reminded him that he really, really wasn't one of them. As long as he was in that house and that thing, he was a, from the tribe of Gilead, man, a Gileadite, and, uh, you know, it was amazing because. Uh, because he experienced such great pains because he was an illegitimate son. You know, when his brothers, when, when his brothers, half-brothers grew up and it was time to divide the inheritance of their father, Jephthah was driven out. His half-brothers considered him as not someone who should get any of his father's inheritance. And so they said, look, well, before we divvy this out, you're out of here, buddy. And Jephthah left. He left, he went up into the hills, and the Bible says that he was with people who were like adventurers, or there were people that were kind of, they were kind of wandering around, but they really didn't have a leader, right? Jephthah, man, became that leader, and if you know the the story that, that uh, uh, as Jephthah, man, as the as Israel, the Gileadites, man, were were facing people coming into, to, uh, Uh, fight against them they were looking around for a leader and they couldn't find one and they said there's this great warrior that's up in the mountains his name is Jephthah and so they call him the leaders call him and if you read the scripture there if you read it in in the book of Judges you'll see where that when they get together with with Jephthah they say they say we want you to lead Israel we want you to lead us we want you to be our leader and he says aren't you the same people see aren't you the same people who hated me Aren't you the same people who drove me out of my tribe? You okay, man? All right. Aren't you the same people who drove me out of my tribe? 
aren't you the ones? And now you want me to come fight for you? And they said, yes, and not only fight for us, but you will be our leader. He said, you're really going to keep your word? And they said, yes. And Jephthah said, oh, okay. So the Bible says, you can read it in there, that he, he, they repeated they repeated those vows, man, in a really sacred place. That's pretty incredibly important, right? Because you see, Jephthah, these very people, they were the leaders of the whole tribe, not just his individual family unit. His whole tribe said, we stand together with your family. We don't want you in here. You're an illegitimate son. Can you imagine the incredible pain that he must have felt? Incredible pain that he must have uh, experienced there, having his own family turn against him. We know the story because Jephthah, Jephthah, in the book of Judges, Jephthah ended up fighting against the warring tribes that came in. And Jephthah tried to parlay with them, but they wouldn't hear it. And so he said, okay. The Bible says when Jephthah went out for, to, for battle, here is a man who was an illegitimate son, who was the son of a prostitute, his own family doesn't want him. But the Bible says, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah. Boy, that's a key thing. I'm just something. There's something about it. In the middle of all that pain, the Spirit of the Lord comes on Jephthah. And Jephthah fights. And he's victorious. And he becomes, a, he becomes a, a, one of the judges for, for Israel, man, for about six years. It's incredible. It's incredible. You know the story too because maybe you know the parts of when Jephthah was returning. He said, Lord, if you put the, give these people into our hands, whatever comes out of my house when I go home, I will offer it to you. And you know the story from the scriptures. It says that his daughter, he only had one child at that time. It was his daughter. He didn't have a son. He had a daughter. And if you don't know anything about about the Jewish culture, you'll understand, you'll understand that people, people knew that if you didn't have any children, the Messiah could not come through your lineage, right? How many hear what I'm saying? In other words, man, there was a promise of the future, and that promise was in the Messiah, and if you didn't have any children, he could, they could not possibly show up through your line or lineage. And so when Jephthah saw her, after they had won, he said, he tore his clothes and he said, you, daughter, you've made me so sad. Some people used to teach that he offered her as a burnt, because he said, I'll offer him as a burnt offering. The language there is very difficult in the scripture. It's in that scripture there, and you can look it up for yourself. It's more accurate to say, I will consecrate whatever comes out of my house or offer a burnt sacrifice. Did Jephthah offer his daughter as a living sacrifice? Absolutely not, because you can read in the scripture in the Old Testament, you can read many places where God says, I will not accept that kind of an offering. God wouldn't accept any kind of a thing that had to do with human sacrifice. In fact, all of the religions around Israel, many of them practice those kind of things, along with, with all kinds of religious sexual activity in order to somehow please God. Lots of the of the gods of the people around them were very, their, their idols and stuff were very phallic looking. And God said, I won't receive any of that. I won't receive any of those things. But here's what was happening. Jephthah knew, I only have one daughter. And here I'm, I, I said I would concentrate, consecrate them to the Lord, offer them to the Lord. This young lady was not married and was still pure. This young lady this young lady was never going to have any children. Jephthah was not going to have, was not going to have any grandkids from this, from this daughter. Yesterday we 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 celebrated the, we celebrated a, the fourth birthday of my my little granddaughter. I couldn't imagine not having a, a little granddaughter like Adeline. She's going to be four years old. You could have seen her yesterday. Uh, after putting together all of the, the uh, 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 Andrew and those guys, they, they decided to get like a play set outside, and so you had to, had to level. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dan, for your, uh, for your tiller because, man, I, we moved tons of dirt, bro. I want you to know. Uh, 
we leveled out a place. They put it all together. We did it all in 24 hours and put it up. And when she came in, didn't know. We go through the whole birthday, gets all of her prizes, and her mommy says, we have one more gift for you, one more prize, one more gift. And she said, Mommy, I don't see any other presents. And so we started joking. We said, oh, maybe a granddaddy. Maybe granddaddy's hiding it. Granddaddy, her granddaddy stood up, her other grandpa. Her granddaddy stood up and looks around. Nope, it's not there. Maybe her Aunt Rachel's got no. And so we went all the way through, and she's looking into all kinds of ottomans. And finally, she goes, hold it. Wait, wait. Maybe we, we all will split up and start looking for the present, okay? She's not, she'll be four years old in just a day or so, a couple of days, and she's already organizing. And then whenever they open the door and she goes outside trying to find her daddy, and there's that play set out there. Man, my heart is going, man, that's my little granddaughter. What a cool thing. You know, in just a couple of days, I have my second granddaughter. She was to be born, Shiloh Grace is what her name will be. She'll be born in Lakeland, Florida in just a couple of days. We're waiting. We're having, her mommy is walking the dog and trying to get ready. She's ready to deliver uh, June 15th. I couldn't imagine, but could you imagine when Jephthah saw what he had promised? He ripped his clothes because he knew that that promise couldn't come through there. You're talking about pain. There was still pain. But God called it uh, God used that, called that great faith. In fact, in, in Hebrews, man, 11, in the great hall of faith, Jephthah's name is mentioned because that one act that he did. Did you know that there are two takeaways? You okay, man? You all right? Huh? What? Do you have to stay up here? Yeah, you get to stay up here with me the whole time. It's lonely up here, man. Go and stand a little closer to me, man, because it's a little lonely up here. You know, you okay, man? Let me see. Okay, yeah, you all right, man? You don't have to go to the ch chiropractor after this. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Greg and Bonnie. Anyway, okay. There are two takeaways that I want you to take with you this morning. First of all, first of all, from this, from the pain. The pain of this life uh, journey often comes from others. Sometimes there's pain that comes from our own sins. And I want you to remember something today, that when you sin, you don't just sin alone, but you sin and it affects other people. How many of you understand that today? Whether you're young or old, whenever you do, it affects other people. But often, please don't take it that if something's happening to somebody that they sinned. That was a very classic thing in the scriptures. He, he must have sinned. Even to Jesus, they said, he, he must have sinned or something. Or his parents must have sinned, but it wasn't in. It was God was going to do a miracle right there. Often, though, Sin comes, uh, pain comes from other people's sin. Things that happen to other people, man, that other people participate in. For Jephthah, it was his father's infidelity. And there was great pain that came in his life, so much so that he had to leave his family. He had to leave everything he had. He had to leave them and not have any inheritance. That sounds pretty bad to me, to have to leave your home and not be able to, not be able to come back to it. You know, it's amazing because... When we suffer sometimes, when we have pain, we all want to run from it. We all will run. In fact, in this community here, people will run from church to church to church. They'll run from speaker to speaker to speaker. They'll get on and give to evangelists, evangelists, evangelists. Why? Because they're running from pain. And, and God is saying, I wish you'd just stop for a second because I'm trying to work something and perfect something in your life. And you keep running so you keep taking all the same stuff with you. You see, God is a lot more interested in developing your character than for you to be comfortable. Boy, that's a hard one. For me, when things don't go right, when I'm disappointed or people let me down or something happens or I let myself down, do you know God is trying to, he comes in, he's trying to teach me something. He's kind of builds some character. He's trying to help me. To, to be what I need to be for the next phase, for the next job, for the next thing that he wants me to do. In fact, if you look at Jephthah's life, you okay, man? You still all right? Do you need, it's like a, you need some water or something? We give you some water. I drank out of that one, but I'll give it to you if you want it. No, okay, okay. okay you all right? Okay, let me help you a little bit. Oh, oh my gosh, that's hard. Okay, hold on there. there look right there. Go ahead, man. Uh, I can't do it. I can't preach and do it, okay? 
could hold it. Jephthah didn't allow his pain, he didn't allow his pain to, de to determine his future. Jephthah overcame it. In fact, it seems that Jephthah, instead of being what everyone else said, the people that disliked him, instead of being that, he said, I'll show you. And he became a mighty warrior. He became someone that God took notice of and said, I can use that man right there. I can use that person right there. In fact, man, when, 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 uh, when pain comes from others, we need, to, we, need to remember, we need to remember that God is working, working in our lives. In James 1, 2 and following, it just says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you might be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. In fact, God is working in you. When there's pain, it's no fun. There have been moments in my life as a parent that I had no words to speak for my children. Have any of you ever experienced that? Come on, let me see your hands. That's not, that's not saying your kids are bad. That's just saying you have no words. There's no earthly wisdom that you can share that can help you. You know, those are the moments when you stop and you go, Lord, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to handle this. This is so painful. I never dreamed I would be in this place. And I desperately need you. You see, when pain comes, the second thing to take away from this is, is when the challenges of life demand, the challenges of life come, the pain comes, the challenges of life demand a close relationship with Jesus. John 5, 1 through 9, it, it really tells us, man, that we, we need to cultivate a relationship with God in the good times and in the painful times. He's the great physician. I often see, I call it cultural Jesus. You know what cultural Jesus is? I'll tell you, I've been here 35 years in Greenville, and I know what cultural Jesus looks like. Cultural Jesus is, man, you may be in bed with somebody on Friday night or Saturday night. You may be at the club, or you may be somewhere else. But on Sunday, you lift in your hands in the south here, and you say, whoa, hallelujah. Whoa, Jesus is good. I call it cultural Jesus. You see, your time, talent, and treasure don't belong to him. You're not a steward of any of that stuff. He's like a giant credit card in the sky. If something goes bad, oh, oh, Jesus, I just hurt myself. I just, oh, oh, uh oh, Lord, I need you to heal my leg. How many of you know he wants to be close to you when things are going good? How many of you know you need to cultivate a close relationship when things are going bad? You need to cultivate, you need to stay close to Jesus all along the way. He understands your pain. He understands your problems. He understands what you're going through. In fact, in, 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 in fact, in Jephthah's story, we see how human nature works. But we also see something, a bright, a bright spot there, how that God worked in the middle of all that pain. And he can do it, if he did it for Jephthah, he'll do it for us. He, he'll do it for us as well. In fact, I, one author said, God is not the spare tire that we only notice when we have a flat tire. We have to have a close relationship to God to the point that he's the center of our lives. He's the powerful, majestic God, and yet he calls us his children. And we can, with intimacy, call to him, Abba, Father. How many of you think that's amazing? You say, Pastor, I thought this was going to be refreshing, replenishing. Here it comes. If you're sitting here with pain today, let me just say a little secret, man. If you're sitting here with, 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 with pain today, I want you to remember something. God knows where you are. You know, if you can say today, you might say, I'm not the son or daughter of a prostitute. Man, you know what you should be doing today? You should be saying, thank you, Lord. You are so good to me. Thank you, God, for putting me where I am. Lord, thank you for what you've done to me. Thank you, Lord. You may feel crushed and insignificant, but you're important to God this morning. He knows the feelings of your hurts and your disappointments. God knows. He's just waiting for you to say, God, this is what I have, and I'm going to give these things to you today, Lord. 
Lord, I understand that you're seeing me, that you know me, and that you want to, you, you, you want to be close to me. Hebrews 4.15 tells us that Jesus understands our weaknesses and is interceding for us. I don't know about you, but we have a, we have a great high priest who's ever interceding for us and saying, Father, this is one of my children. This is one of my, one of my people. This is one of my people. Is it heavy, loose now? Man, light now, huh? Pretty e easier to carry, right? This is one of my people. This is one of mine. These are my, Lord, Father, Father, touch them right now. Father, bless their lives. Father. In fact, in Israel's case, you say, and we didn't tell you the first of the story, but in Israel's case, it was the same thing they did every single time. They always broke their promise to God. Every single time. In fact, it says Israel did evil on the sight of the Lord. They worshiped the false gods. And they quit serving God. But when they turned to God, God heard their cry. You hear what I'm saying? When they, when they brought their pain to God, he said, why should I help you? You haven't even been worshiping me. And they said, oh, do with this as you want to, Lord. You can read it in Judges. Do as you want to us, but just save us. Have you ever felt that way? You ever had that kind of pain in your life? That kind of disappointment surrounding things? You ever invested in someone else's life and then they walked away? You ever invested in a relationship and, and only to find out that it was only one-sided and it wasn't two-sided and you invested and you think, man, I lost two or three or four or five years of investment. Jesus is saying today, hey, bring me those disappointments. Bring me that pain. Bring me that hurt. In fact, the Bible says that God, if you read the language there, God could not, could not turn off the cries of Israel. And he reached out his hand and he raised up Jephthah. How many think that's pretty incredible? Let me just say something. He's no respecter of persons today. If you're in pain this morning, God will meet your needs. God will meet your needs. I'm going to let you sit down now, man. Is that okay? You all right now? Okay. Do we need to help you down? Okay, someone might need to help him. Give him a big hand, everybody. You know, you're one of his today, and, and as we get ready to, to, to do this, I'm going to ask our guys to come back to the, to, the, uh, to the instruments and do. I want you to remember that you belong to him. You belong to God. And you know what? You belong here. You, you belong here today. Listen to me. You belong here today. God is speaking to your life. And you belong here. God ha wants to do something in your life. Not because of me or pastor or any other pastor, but because of who God is. God wants to do something. He wants to heal the hurts. He wants to bring, in fact, if I had another title or a subtitle for this message, I would not say, I would say T-shirts and scars. Or maybe pain, pain, right? Joy out of pain. God is the only one who can trade your mourning into dancing. Turn it into dancing. He's the only one who can do it. I love 1 Peter 5, 7 because he says, Cast all your cares or anxiety on him because he cares for you. And of course, my scripture, if you wanted a scripture that encapsulated this, and I've done it backwards this morning, I hope that's okay with you. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Are you tired? Are you filled with hurts and disappointments? Bring them to Jesus. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do today. These guys are going to play. And I'm going to ask some prayer people to come up and be at the front. you got a Band-Aid here, and here's what I want to ask you to do with it, Okay. You know what you're struggling with right now. You know what hurt or disappointment. You know what pain you're dealing with right now. I want you to just, there's pins in the back of the seat in front of you. Would you just take it out and write it on this band-aid real quick? Would you do it? You say, well, Pastor, I don't know if I want to do it. That's, well, I think it has to do with moving to God, moving towards God. Here's what I'd like for you to do. I'd like for you to write it on there. And if you say, well, man, mine is too long, I couldn't get it on there, I just want you to hold that Band-Aid in your hand. And here's what I'd like for you to do. 
I want to get some people. If I got bored, there's guys or staff, the staff guys up here, just across here. If you got something that you just need somebody, you may not even tell them what it is, but here's what I'd like for you to do. If you need special prayer, first of all, if you need special prayer for something that's going on in your life, God answers prayer. Do you believe it today? He'll turn your pain, He'll bring joy out of your pain. You know, one of our kids were struggling. God began to speak to people in this church. We didn't tell them all the things that we had experienced. But if I did, if I did, you'd want to come up and pat me on the back and say, the, the good old southern thing, bless his heart. Yeah, here's the way it works, man. God knows those things. There's a fight for life. Jesus, the Holy Spirit, is fighting for the life of some of our kids today, some of our families today. He's fighting. And some of us are walking around, we're so hurt, and we go, that's all the devil wants to do is get you to think that you deserve this. You're a child of the king. Here's what he's waiting for. I love for you to just bring that up and say, pastor, person, you don't even have to have anything written on it, but I want to give this to you and I want you to pray. I've got a special thing and I'm giving this hurt to Jesus. For the rest, I'm going to ask you to do something else and I don't know whether you'll do it this morning or not. If you do, that's great. If you don't, you have to answer to God. But if you got something, here's what I love for you.